Thanks so much, Petra, and uh, thanks for inviting me. Great to be with you here today. Uh, I'll be sharing my screen so that I can uh, give you a scientific overview of, to start with, the challenges we're facing as humanity on planet Earth, but also to update you on the state of the climate system and also the outcomes of COP28 and then focus in on the transition pathways for a safe and just landing for humanity on planet Earth. And the starting point here is really 30 years of scientific evidence that shows that we are deep into the Anthropocene, the new geological epoch, where we are the dominating geological force of change on planet Earth, and that we are at risk of destabilizing not only life support systems that we humans depend on, but the entire state of the planet. So the starting point for any lecture on earth system science or global sustainability, I would argue must start here. We have four interconnected crises at the global level occurring simultaneously. We're deep into the climate crisis, feeling the impacts for hundreds of millions of people already today. We have an ecological crisis, the sixth mass extinction of species, undermining and threatening food systems, carbon sequestration, moisture feedback, ecological functioning in the earth system. We have a pandemic risks that rise as another hockey stick. COVID-19 is just merely a manifestation of unsustainable human pressures on ecosystems because these are zoonotic viral disease outbreaks, viruses that spill over from unsustainable risks in our penetration of natural habitats through domestic animals to humans. And then, of course, the geopolitical shakeup in the world with the instability in Ukraine, Gaza, a world potentially moving towards a new Cold War state. That's the world we're living in. That is why we have more and more academic focus on the risks of moving towards a polycrisis, meaning that the risks we're posing on destabilizing the planet in the environmental space is no longer a question of environmental sustainability. It's a question of security, of stability, of societal uh, development into the future. And the poly crisis is defined when you have multiple global risks occurring simultaneously and reinforcing each other. For example, an economic crisis, inflation, a war, energy insecurity, impacting on droughts, floods, rising prices of fertilizers, triggering food insecurity, causing displacement, pushing people into migration, and reinforcing the risk of armed conflicts. We see these examples in Syria. We see the examples in Sudan. We saw the examples in the Arab Spring. We see these uh, risks of interactions between social, physical, and environmental uh, changes occurring across the world. So the fact that we're in the Anthropocene is a fundamental entry point. The evidence is mounting very rapidly. You've certainly seen all the data with regards to ecological change. 70%, 70% of vertebrates populations have disappeared since only 1970. One million out of the measured eight million species are threatened by extinction. So we are at a point where we are uh, losing the functions and resilience in the earth system while we at the same time are causing unprecedented energy imbalance on planet Earth. We published this paper just uh, two months ago, just before COP28, on the 2023 State of the Climate Report, showing for essentially all parameters in the climate system, you see them to the right here, how you are having 50 years of high variability and rising risks. Those are the gray lines on Antarctic sea ice extent, uh, temperatures in the North Atlantic, surface temperatures in the atmosphere, cumulative forest fires, and then you see the 2023 off the charts observations, which are so much off the charts, so many standard deviations outside even of the rising changes of the past 50 years, that we in science are not only shocked, but also do not have an answer. We cannot explain it. What we can do unfortunately, is that we have to pose a question. Are we approaching a state shift? Is this potentially the first signs 
of an earth system losing so much of its buffering capacity that you're seeing feedbacks being hit back towards unexpectedly large deviations, even from the large impacts we've seen over the past 50 years. We do not know. That's the honest answer, but it's a warning sign. Where does this come from? Well, we do understand that this is a, a result of the uh, you know, increasing temperatures on Earth and the energy imbalance cause, but also the fact that we have had three super El Nino events over the past 25 years, 1998, 2016. 2016 is still officially the warmest year measured on planet Earth. 2023, in a few days' time, I can assure you, will be declared the warmest year ever recorded. It's a year where we, for the first time, touch 1.5 degrees Celsius, two months, and we've even parts of days at two degrees Celsius of warming. So what we are seeing in 2023, even though we cannot explain it, is undoubtedly an ocean which has absorbed over 90% of the heat caused by our fossil fuel burning, which is, so to say, misbehaving, starting to feed back in unexpected ways. That is the reality. That is what we have to understand. That's the warning. So it's with this evidence we went to COP28 in Dubai, really putting forward all the science, presenting the first global tipping point report, uh, presenting all the evidence of risk of destabilizing the Earth system and the urgency, and what you see on the screen is the outcome. Of course, there is reason to be very concerned with an outcome that could not talk clear in clear terms about the urgent need to phase out fossil fuels, about the need to quantify uh, year by year today, bending the global curve of emissions within the next two years, cutting emissions by half by 2030, cutting the emissions again by 2040, to a net zero world economy by 2050, we needed this to come even further in terms of a concrete plan. However, my at least my conclusion is that we got something we can work with. It was a milestone on two accounts. One is, which is really important to remember, all nations agreed, which means that here we have the first COP meeting hosted by an oil and gas nation, um, fundamentally, um, having the support from all the oil, gas, and coal nations in the world, accepting that we are now transitioning away from fossil fuels in this critical decade in line with science. That means that uh, we've turned a corner. We've turned a corner in the sense that there's no uh, room for climate skepticism anymore. Everyone, even those in the deepest, deepest, the deepest vested interest, are now in agreement. We have a real problem. The real problem is caused primarily by fossil fuel burning, and we need to transition away from this as fast as possible. That's the good news. But what furthermore is quite reassuring in this document, and I put that in the two uh, red squares here, is that there are some numbers. We, we have spent, we spent around the clock in Dubai to provide all the detailed numbers from the IPCC and beyond. But what remained in the compromise is what you see here. It does actually say 43% reductions by 2030. It does say 60% reductions by 2035 and net zero by 2050. That is positive because that's something we, we can account against. We can hold countries accountable against that. We're also clear that it's a question of transitioning away as fast as possible. We're talking about a trebling of renewable energy, and there's a clear statement of reaching uh, net carbon emissions on, on methane by 2030. So uh, even though it doesn't take us all the way, it's at least one step in the right direction. The problem is that it comes 10 years too late because this is what we needed already in the Paris Agreement because now we've reached a point of climate forcing that is uh, summarized in the latest 2023 uh, Forster et al. paper showing that we have a net climate forcing of three watts per square meter, which is uh, counterbalanced by the fact that we have a cooling of almost one watt per square meter because of air pollution. So we have a massive paradox here that uh, our climate crisis causing global warming is, is uh, to a very significant extent, almost 25% of the forcing is hidden by another environmental 
problem, namely air pollution, because there's air pollutants in the city that causes the smog, which causes uh, uh, a relative cooling of the planet. But the key um, factor to, to understand is that it's one thing of the forcing we're causing when we burn fossil fuels. The more important indicator is the energy imbalance that we can today uh, conclude without any hesitation that Earth is out of energy balance. And the energy balance is, is what is in the pipeline. What's the, the heat that we have accumulated, which even if we turned off all the additional forcing, will still remain in the system. And this heating adds up to something like uh, 0.8 watts per square meter. That is a big number. It's actually, um, you know, should be compared to um, the, the, the forcing levels that we consider that the planet can cope with, which is somewhere between 1 and 1.5 watts per square meter. And the figure you see to the left here, which comes from the Shukman et al. Uh, global inventory of the energy imbalance, reminds us of something really important, that the ocean has absorbed uh, almost 90% of the heat caused by fossil fuel burning. Melting ice uh, consumes energy and has uh, corresponds to roughly 4% of the heat. But when that ice is melt, that heat will be instead in the atmosphere. It's only 2% of the heat which is in the atmosphere causing the 1.2 degrees Celsius warming so far. And land has absorbed another 5%. So not only are we heating up the temperatures on Earth, we are loading the whole system with energy. And what you see to the right here is the curve of heat. Just look at this curve, this hockey stick of rising energy imbalance. The blue parts here are the heat absorbed in the ocean. And the darker wedges further down is this reminder that ice, land, um, and, um, and atmosphere absorbs small parts, but a significant portion of the heat as well. And all of this is playing out in extreme events. 2023 is, is a, an extraordinary year uh, in terms of moving off the charts. But remember also, and this is just a graph I took from Al Jazeera, that for the first time we have on all continents plus 55 degrees Celsius of life-threatening heat shocks. And this has never occurred before. You may remember in 2021 when we were shocked by the British Columbia 49.6 degrees Celsius, which led the city of Lytton to burn down a disaster in one part of planet Earth. 2023, you have this occurrence across the entire planet to the extent that I find that quite significant when Taylor Swift was supposed to hold her concert in Rio de Janeiro, she canceled because of the life-threatening 50 degrees plus heat wave. So truly, I would argue, undoubtedly scientifically, we need to become stewards of the entire planet. Now is the time to recognize we are putting the stability of the whole system at risk. Is this understood? Yes, it is. Even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the consensus across the entire climate science community in the sixth assessment, comes to the following conclusions. Climate change is now threatening human well-being. We're in the climate crisis today, but it's also threatening the stability of the planet, the entire health of the planet. And not only that, it won't be enough to phase out fossil fuels. In the C36 conclusion, the lowest part of the screen, you see a very important additional conclusion which takes us to the planetary boundaries, namely that we also need to conserve biodiversity. We need the resilience in the living biosphere to also be intact. And we've shown in, in several scientific studies just over the last few years that even if we phase out all fossil fuels, we would still breach the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit. Why? Because we're losing carbon uptake capacity in the ocean, not so significantly in the ocean so far, but there are signs, but certainly on ecosystems on land. And this is in itself uh, an argument why we need to come back in within planetary boundaries and use the planetary boundaries as our guide for economic development. Now, this is therefore the proof that, that nature is what provides a stability in the, in the ultimate uh, determination of, of the state 
of, of the resilience or, or health of the planet. And let me prove that to you, which is uh, the second scientific element that brings us to the planetary boundary framework. If the first element is the Anthropocene and all the pressures, the second part is the remarkable stability of the state of the planet that enables civilizations to develop. And you have the evidence on the screen right in front of you now. This is the Osman et al. most authoritative summary of the journey of planet Earth over the past 20,000 years. On the y-axis, you have global mean surface temperature. The zero point there is 14 degrees Celsius, the pre-industrial temperature on Earth before we start burning fossil fuels. You see minus six degrees Celsius is deep ice age. We leave the last ice age 18,000 years ago, and then we come into this remarkably stable Holocene state. The last 10,000 years, we call this the Holocene, a warm interglacial, 14 degrees Celsius, plus minus 0 0.5, maximum variability 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. And then we start burning fossil fuels, and you see the furthest right, the little blip there, and we crash through the 1.2 degrees Celsius line uh, last year which is already three times higher, almost three times higher than what we've experienced during the Holocene. Why is this important? Well, it's because we have been modern humans on planet Earth for the past 250,000 years. So we have lived through two ice ages and two interglacials. And the, it's only when we leave the last ice age, 18,000 years ago, that we transition from hunters and gatherers. We are a few million people on planet Earth, very rough times and environmental variability into becoming farmers. We go through the most important revolution of all revolutions we've experienced, the Neolithic 10,000 years ago. We transition and become farmers, sedentary communities, and off we go in the civilizational journey as we know it today. So the Holocene is unique because we know today that the reason why we go through the Neolithic revolution is the stability and harmony in the environmental conditions on Earth. The hydrological cycle, the ecosystems, the ocean, everything that we nurture, everything that we love on planet Earth settles down in the Holocene. This is the Garden of Eden for development of civilizations as we know it. So the Holocene is the reference point for the desired state of the planet. Can we prove this? Well, the answer is yes. Because the answer, the question is, of course, why has the planet been in such a stable state and, and tried to remain in that state? Well, we have the Global Carbon Project, which released its latest assessment for 2023. So I apologize for only having the 2022 budget here at COP28 in Dubai, showing uh, how, and what you see here is on the x-axis from 1850 until today, y-axis is gigatons of carbon. So it's the carbon cycle, the emissions of carbon. Above the zero line, you have the hockey stick, a fossil fuel burning in gray and land use change in orange. Is it all of this that has caused the warming on planet Earth so far? No, a healthy planet in a Holocene biogeophysical functioning tries to buffer that stress. And just look at the dark green line, which is uptake of carbon in the ocean. The light green line is uptake of carbon on land. It's only the blue part, which is the residual remaining in the atmosphere causing the warming of the planet so far. And you can just be a, you know, you can be a child in kindergarten to see the remarkable behavior of this system. The planet is under pressure, gets punched by our fossil fuel burning, and the more we punch her, the more she's helping us. The biogeophysical absorption capacity on a healthy planet is, is a stress response trying to buffer and dampen that heat pressure. On the right-hand side, you have an even more dramatic proof of this. Here you have a planet that goes from cooling to massive absorption of heat. This is heat uptake in the ocean, the 93% of heat taken up in the ocean from our fossil fuel burning. So here you have a planet under stress that apply its biogeochemical processes to remain in the Holocene state. That is what we've learned. The problem is we're starting to see cracks in this system because of science like this showing that particularly ecosystems on land are starting to show signs of losing that carbon uptake capacity. The Brazilian part of the Amazon has already tipped over from sink to source. So this is what makes us really concerned and, and requires from us to understand that there is a need to start 
defining a safe space for humanity to keep the planet in a Holocene state. But we need one more piece of evidence before being able to quantify the safe space. And that is that we have learned that the planet is a self-regulating complex system that has multiple stable states for its big biophysical systems. We call these tipping elements, push them too far and they cross tipping points. We've mapped these tipping points and you have here the map of the latest science published two years ago or yeah, one year ago in the David McKay et al. paper presenting the 16 big climate tipping element systems that fulfill these two criteria. One is that they contribute to regulate the climate system, but secondly, that they also have multiple stable states. Push them too far and they cross a tipping point. The breakthrough with this science is the color scheme. This is the first time we're able to put a range of temperatures at which these systems are at risk of crossing their tipping points. And of course, the ones we're really nervous about are the ones in dark red, these five. The Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, the boreal permafrost, the barren sea ice, and the tropical coral reef systems that are likely to cross their tipping points at 1.5 degrees Celsius. This is what helps us to place the boundaries. We place the climate boundary to stay away from the risk of crossing these tipping points. This is why I argue very strongly that 1.5 degrees Celsius is not a Paris Agreement target. It's not a goal. It's not something you negotiate with. It's a limit. It's a physical limit. You don't want to go beyond it because we risk causing irreversible changes. If we cause irreversible melting of the Greenland ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet, this represents 10 meters sea level rise. So in truth, you put all this evidence together, we really need to become stewards of the entire planet. But before coming then to the planetary boundaries, let me just remind us that at COP28, we actually put forward the, the latest scientific evidence that even though 1.5 degrees Celsius is a planetary boundary, we don't want to go beyond it. We unfortunately have made so limited progress, we're so deep into the crisis, that it's very unlikely that we can avoid overshoot. What does overshoot mean? Well, the IPCC has run a whole series of scenarios around this. This is the so-called C2 family of scenarios, those scenarios that take us to 1.5 after a period of overshoot, meaning that we breach 1.5, we have a few decades of overshoot before coming back to 1.5. They do require following the green pathway towards a net zero world economy by 2050, according to the COP28 outcome, but they look like this. They crash through 1.5 somewhere between 2030 and 2035. So that's something we need to recognize. We are very likely going to uh, hit through 1.5 within the next 10 years. They have a 30, 40 year overshoot, an overshoot reaching 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 degrees Celsius of overshoot. So it's up to 1.8 degrees Celsius of mean global mean surface temperature before coming back to 1.5 by the end of this century. This is, most scientists today agree, the best we can accomplish. This is like very unfortunate, but it cannot get better than this because of the energy imbalance we've caused on planet Earth. The challenge for us is the following. Number one, what happens during overshoot? Well, for one, we know that extreme events will be hitting even harder. 2023, which was a 1.2 degrees Celsius year, amplified to 1.5 because of a, a super El Nino. Well, here we're talking about 30, 40 years continuously above 1.5. So that, that will be a rough ride, undoubtedly. But then the big question is, in my mind, what brings us back? Well, the only chance of coming back is the biosphere. It is that we can bring ourselves back within the safe operating space of planetary boundaries. So here you have all the science, the Anthropocene posing the pressure, the Holocene being a reference point for a desired planet. The tipping points are hardwired and we need to stay away. That is what brought us to the planetary boundaries. That is what takes us to the need to have a full system approach for planetary stability. We've identified nine planetary boundaries, published first time in 2009, update in 2015, third update in 2023. This is the 2023 update. Six of the nine boundaries are outside of the safe space. The yellow-orange part is the uncertainty range in science. 
those that are beyond that are at high risk, meaning that we are starting to see evidence on the boundaries that we're losing the resilience of the planet to buffer the impacts of climate. So, so that is what, what I would argue is the biggest and most important message to humanity. You cause an energy imbalance from fossil fuel burning, the climate boundaries in the red, and at the same time, you're losing the strength of the planet in the biosphere boundaries on biodiversity, land system change, freshwater change, and overloading of nitrogen and phosphorus, which together weakens the planet's capacity to buffer. We have presented this work now across the world and also advanced through the Earth Commission for the first time, linking in, integrating the social sciences into the safe part of the planetary boundaries. This has given us the safe and just Earth system boundaries. The safe boundaries remain the planetary boundaries, but the just boundaries are based on justice. And the justice parts can be assessed in, in many different ways, as we know. One of them is what is the significant harm levels, the, the, the maximum allowed harm that, that we can accept uh, and tolerate. Second is, of course, uh, a fair access to resources. How do we fairly redistribute the budgets, the finite budgets within planetary boundaries? And then, of course, you also have the expression of rights, uh, rights of expression and, and uh, agency for social, for all, all human beings on planet Earth. The Earth Commission has started with the first one of these, which is on, on uh, maximum allowed levels of significant harm. And the assessment is as follows. What you see here is five of the nine planetary boundaries have been assessed. Climate, air pollutants, aerosol loading, uh, biogeochemical flows, so nitrogen and phosphorus to the left, so nutrient loading, fresh water represented in groundwater and surface water and and biodiversity intact nature and managed nature managed nature is agriculture intact nature is the remaining 50 percent of planet earth on land which is still in reasonably intact uh, state the the inner circle here in in the, the outer part of that circle is um, for the light green when safe and just scientifically correspond to each other, which is really reassuring. That is when social sciences assess that the natural scientifically based safe boundaries are also, uh, as far as we understand today, the just boundaries. So you cannot, when, when uh, natural science says, or ecologists say that you cannot lose more biodiversity in intact ecosystems, that's also the point at which social impacts are unacceptably high. Focus on the red lines. Though those are the ones that are really key. So climate is, is a very important example here. The red line is the safe planetary boundary on climate. 1.5 degrees Celsius, go beyond it, and we're likely to cause irreversible changes in the climate system. But from a social science perspective, from a justice perspective, the blue line shows that we, we exceed significant harm to people already at one degree Celsius. Go beyond one degree and we have such large impacts on hundreds of millions of people affected, livelihoods destroyed, uh, impacts on, on uh, heat threatening health at a level that is, uh, from a social science significant harm perspective, unacceptable. So this shows that if you take a justice perspective into account, the safe space shrinks even further. And it means that for climate, that we're already outside of the just boundary, even though we're rapidly approaching the safe boundary. The same occurs for air pollution, and the same occurs for, for nitrogen overloading. But for the rest, they, they stay the same. And this is a, a breakthrough, because for the first time, we're measuring safety and justice according to the same currency units. So all of this requires action. We have uh, a lot of action on, on uh, efforts to, to try and accelerate the pathways towards a net zero landing on energy, a net zero landing on, on land use. We have the numbers for this. We've also calculated the budgets that this is associated with in terms of fossil fuel phase out, but also agriculture, managing intact nature, managing oceans and carbon dioxide removals. I find this to be really important to to propose a new accounting system for carbon in order to avoid what we have a tendency to see that uh, actors say, well, 
we cannot really phase out fossil fuels fast enough to stay within the carbon budget of 250 billion tons of carbon dioxide for fossil fuels, which requires a net zero world economy by 2050. So we will offset that by doing massive afforestation plantation projects in agriculture, or, or even invest in conserving a part of the Amazon rainforest for the carbon budget in the third line here. That does not work. Scientifically, we have to do all of these five simultaneously. We, we have such a significant energy imbalance that we need to phase out fossil fuels, number one here, and transition into sustainable agriculture, number two, go from source plus four to sink minus five billion tons of carbon dioxide within 30 years, plus secure three and four, which is the uptake of carbon in nature on land and in the ocean, and start removing carbon dioxide through different technologies. All of this has to happen simultaneously. Was Dubai the point when we tipped the scale towards, you know, an accelerated pathway back into safe operating space? I think that's um, unlikely. I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, that we have something to work with, but there's so much more still to be done to really accelerate the pathway towards the positive tipping points that we have to see if we are to have any chance of coming back within a manageable, safe and just space for humanity on planet Earth. And with that, back to you, Petra. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this exciting um, presentation. And um, we now open the floor for questions um, from the audience. Uh, my colleagues um, will collect them. Um, in the meantime, I do have a question. Um, we heard a lot of from you that um, uh, all the scientists and academia has all the data. You have some models. You see um, the sectors that in which um, work still has to be um, done. What would you say that scientists and academics have to do um, also to influence uh, politics and to um, to achieve the goals? Is there um, something that they have to do additionally to that that already has been done um, in the past few years? Mm. Yeah, no, that's a really good good question, Petra. And, and I have I've kind of a, a two part answer to that question. On the one hand, I'm of the view, and this may come across as being a little bit old fashioned and conservative perhaps, but I'm, I am actually of the view, despite myself being very much out and communicating science, I am of the view that science needs to stay with science, that, that we need to be really truthful to the integrity of science and not, not load upon ourselves as academics to take the responsibility for, for activism or, so to say, going beyond our role as, as communicating the science. I think that's so valuable and so important and the trust in science is so fundamental. That said, secondly, I think we have not been so good at communicating the science. Uh, if you go out to the streets here in uh, Potsdam or Berlin where I am, I mean, if I find anyone who knows what 1.5 degrees Celsius and global mean surface temperature rise means, I would be happy. And that, of course, is, is very dramatic because it's probably the most important number in the world by far. So, of course, we have not been able, we've not succeeded in really communicating. And I think we're getting better. We're seeing more documentaries on Netflix and uh, YouTube and uh, social media. And I think we're better at, at, at kind of in this uh, unfortunate, the, the, this uh, a world of misinformation, I think we are doing more work on, on trying to get through with the truth and with science, but, but still, I think we have to do much more. Thank you very much. And um, I see a few questions uh, from the audience. Um, one is from uh, Ofiani, and um, there's a question is, uh, I think countries in the north contribute significantly more to climate change than countries in the south, um, as they use and consume more energy for industrial activities. Do you have um, a comment um, on this? And um, probably also have you seen um, a dynamic at the COP28, for example, um, how it is worked towards um, this issue. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree, Afiani, and, uh, and this is 
of course, fundamental that uh, the world's rich nations, let's call them the OECD bloc, have, has a responsibility to move faster. And, and we put forward actually at COP28, for example, a suggestion that the OECD countries need to completely phase out coal 10 years faster than the non-OECD countries in the world and need to put finance behind helping developing countries to transition in, a, in an orderly way that secures economic development. So you're absolutely right. That said, uh, what, what one has to recognize is that the big change in the climate policy in the world from the old Kyoto Protocol, when we had an Annex 1 for rich countries and an Annex 2 for developing countries, the Paris Agreement, uh, the breakthrough there is that it, it shows that we're all in this together. We must all work together. And I would quite strongly support that part. I'm quite critical of the Paris Agreement that it has all this voluntary basis, but still the fact that we need to work together because the fossil fuel used today is, is rising very fast in, in, in essentially the entire world, particularly in emerging economies. And it's no longer possible to uh, uh, leave countries like India or Indonesia or Nigeria or Brazil or China, for that matter, uh, aside from the decarbonization path. And then finally, I say this also for the following reason. A big change over the past eight years, which I didn't talk at all about in this talk, is that we have more and more evidence, as I'm sure you're aware, that phasing out fossil fuels is not a sacrifice it's not it's not um, a step backwards in development on the contrary it's a step forward towards a new modernity it gives more jobs better economy it's actually cheaper essentially all electricity produced from fossil fuels is today uh, uh, a loss an economic loss it's, it's much cheaper even without subsidies to produce electricity from renewables. And this means that it would be a mistake to, um, to allow the world's developing countries to stay on a fossil fuel track longer than necessary, because then you'll end up in a situation where the global north comes out essentially as, as, a, as a winning party in, in the economic development competition once, once again. So I, I think it's, it's, it's important to have justice and equity at the center, but it's also important to recognize that we're all on a decarbonization path. Thank you very much. We do have um, some um, kind of follow-up questions regarding um, the topic of carbon credits. And um, um, yeah, the participants wonder whether you think that um, carbon credits might be um, a good climate governance tool or probably do we need other um, yeah, tools in this sphere as well and also connected to the question um, to developing countries whether it's fair and ethical to use these carbon credits uh, schemes that we have so far. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm quite skeptical to, to carbon credit schemes. I assume that you're referring to the voluntary carbon credit schemes and particularly nature climate solutions or carbon credits for, for nature based solutions. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm not against them. I think you can work with them, particularly high quality carbon credits, but it's absolutely necessary, which is what I closed with in my talk, that these are kept outside of, of the offsetting against fossil fuel emissions. So you cannot have aviation companies buying cheap carbon credits for afforestation projects and then account for, for that to be somehow giving the impression that you have a, a net zero carbon neutral uh, aviation company, for example, that, that's simply nonsense. And, and this is really important to recognize that that carbon credits outside of the fossil fuel industry need to be additional. Um, so yes, work with uh, with carbon credits, but work with with communities on the ground for development projects that build resilience of local land, water, biodiversity systems. But but do it additionally to the work of phasing out fossil fuels. 
And I would say that what, what we need more than carbon credits is a price on carbon. And that price on carbon should be a price um, putting a high price on, on the fossil fuel uh, production and fossil fuel emissions in order to uh, give the right incentives in the economies to, to accelerate the pathway away from these fossil fuels. Now, you will, may then react, well, but that increases price of, of energy, electricity and heat and cooling. Well, not necessarily, because if you have a functioning governance, those uh, taxes, which are then ending up in, in the coffers of uh, finance ministries can be redistributed back into social welfare. And that's what we see in, in most functioning carbon price uh, mechanisms today. And, 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 and when not done, that is what, when you get very strong pushbacks, when simply prices just increase. So, so it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not correct to say that the reason why we have to keep oil, coal, and gas is to keep uh, life costs low. That is incorrect. Um, you can uh, punish unsustainable energy use and at the same time compensate socially for that additional cost for the low-income households, while at the same time invest in pathways towards renewable energy systems, which in the end will be cheaper. So it's a transition phase. It's it's a it is admittedly a difficult transition phase, but it can be it can be handled in ways that protect the poorest uh, consumers of energy. Thanks a lot. There's another question regarding developments um, in the Middle East um, from Ahmed um, Shakfa. And um, he refers to the map title tipping elements in the earth system and mentions that um, there are no warning signs um, in the region of the Middle East. And he assumes that the region is a significant hotspot for climate change, particularly in terms of land degradation and um, whether you could give um, insights um, um, whether there's not enough research um, regarding the region in the Middle East or um, the impacts are comparatively less severe than in other regions. Um, yeah. yeah, no, thanks. That, that's a really important question. And, and it also enables me to, to make an explanation that um, there's a complete, it's, it's completely different uh, topics, uh, the assessment of extreme, even extreme climate impacts, which is what is the threat to the Middle East. That's one, one important topic. And a different topic is the risk of crossing tipping points in tipping element systems. And what are the tipping element systems? These are only, only the big biophysical systems that we have the scientific evidence that they, number one, regulate the climate system, and number two, have multiple stable states. So that's why a system like the Green Ice Sheet gets identified and the big Amazon rainforest, because they have that proof. You're right, there might still be science required to see whether some of the arid, um, more desert environments have that function, but so far there's no evidence that they do. So they fall in, in topic one. And topic one are the ones hit on the short term with life-threatening, immediate extreme events, heat, drought, water scarcity, uh, falling groundwater tables, food insecurity, all of this, you're absolutely right. That That's, um, that's a completely different uh, area of concern on its own, which is, by the way, the area of concern which is affecting the entire world. But what I was sharing here was only uh, the climate tipping point assessment. And, and so far, we have only 16 climate tipping point systems. So there are very few of them uh, spread around planet Earth, which are these big, big biophysical systems like the Green Ice Sheet, like the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation which has this this role of 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 regulating the climate system but 
but I'm I'm equally or if not even more concerned on the short term on exactly the topic that you raise, which is the risk of, of undermining uh, livelihood conditions, in particular vulnerable, water scarce, arid regions. But it's actually you have other. Let me just give you an example of another hot spot, which is the Arctic. The Arctic is warming three times faster than the planet as a whole. So, so reindeer herding communities up in the Arctic are rapidly, rapidly seeing their entire life support disappearing in front of their eyes. But that's not a tipping element system because um, the uh, ice sheet, ice on sea in the Arctic does not have, as far as we understand so far at least, a significant enough role in causing feedbacks regulating the functioning of, of the climate system, but it certainly certainly threatens the four million people depending on that ecosystem for their livelihoods. So so these are these are two two threats in parallel. And and thanks for asking that question because I did not emphasize on on the first one. Thank you. We now have two um, questions um, that are connected more to technological solutions, um, uh, maybe. And the first one is, um, what is your opinion on the possible role of stratospheric aerosol injection as a method to quickly reduce the global mean surface temperature on a short term basis? And uh, the second question that goes in a similar direction, um, how could the task force focus on uh, renewable energy technologies and low emission strategies clarify how the goal of doubling global renewable energy capacity and improving energy efficiency achieved in alignment with the objectives outlined um, in the COP28 uh, agreement, um, especially regarding the implementation of technologies such as carbon capture and storage and the production of low carbon hydrogen. Also, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so on, on stratospheric aerosols, I'm I'm very concerned and and a skeptic with regards to geoengineering of that sort. I mean, like solar radiative management or stratospheric aerosol loading or or fertilizer uh, fertilizing of oceans. These have such a large risk of of unintended side effects, and stratospheric aerosol loading has the very negative effect that it would not stop ocean acidification. So you would still be loading carbon dioxide into the earth system. And the moment you stop with the stratospheric aerosol cooling, you would have an abrupt, a very abrupt uh, temperature increase. So you, you would basically get addicted to, to that aerosol loading. But I do recognize though that these topics you know, for every year that passes where we come closer to unmanageable conditions, all these topics come higher and higher up on the agenda. I mean, everything from geoengineering to nuclear power to all, all forms of, of big technology. So, so I think we have to keep an eye on these topics and, and not just push them aside, but actually research them and, and have Good, good knowledge of risks and, and potentials. And the same goes for CCS. It's important to, to remind that in the IPCC and in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there are no pathways to 1.5, not even the C2 family, the ones with overshoot, without scaling of carbon capture storage. So the, the scenarios show we have to decarbonize, we have to transition the food system, we have to keep nature intact and we have to scale carbon dioxide removal. Both CCS, so plugging in carbon capture and storage in the difficult to abate industries like the petrochemical industries, but also scaling direct air capture and, and removal of carbon dioxide. So, and we're not doing that. We're, we are so far doing it at, at best at a pilot level of a few million tons of carbon dioxide when we have to go to the billions of carbon dioxide. So that that is unavoidable. That kind of technology development has to happen. I see that to be a much lower risk than uh, stratospheric aerosol loading type geoengineering. 
but there are risks, but, but we have no choice then, you know, we have been for 250 years emitting carbon dioxide. It's a long living greenhouse gas that stays in the atmosphere for centuries. We have to remove a significant portion of this and, and that has to occur with different forms of, of CDR or carbon dioxide removal technologies. Thank you very much. And um, we have a more um, basic question on the um, planetary boundaries that you already have elaborated on, of course. Um, and um, it's a rather critical question. Um, and um, the participant mentions that in the past, there have been questionings on how the boundaries are set as there is no evidence to define them. And what do you think about this critics? And do you also think um, that also applies to the justice boundaries um, you mentioned today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, since the first publication of the Planetary Boundary Framework, which was published as a challenge to the scientific community, there's been something like 2,000 peer-reviewed papers criticizing and critically assessing the framework and um, advancing and improving the quantifications. Um, I mean, to give you one example, just the last three, four years, there's been massive efforts from the water research science community to improve the quantifications of the safe boundaries now on both green and blue water so both groundwater and surface water and, and soil moisture so i'm i'm quite um, to be honest uh, feel quite reassured by by the whole uh, scientific process and it's not correct that there isn't uh, let's say a reference point to measure against that that's one of the foundations of the planetary boundary framework that the Holocene is the reference point. So you see today for climate, for biosphere integrity, um, on functional diversity, but also for freshwater, the, the safe boundary level is actually measured against uh, staying within the, um, the variability range of, of the Holocene, which is, um, I think, scientifically quite a robust or a very robust approach. That the second approach is to avoid crossing tipping points. So, so at what points in terms of ecosystem change or shifts in the hydrological cycle, uh, are we seeing evidence of causing shifts in the functioning of those boundary processes outside of, of what can, as far as we understand it, keep the tipping element systems on, on the right side of the fence, as it were. So. I would argue that there is, you know, you're right, there are for, for the nine boundaries, different methodologies applied. There are several control variables emerging for, for, for each of the boundaries, which I think is really good quantifications, many quantification ways of measuring boundaries. But I would quite strongly argue that there is a reference point to Holocene and that we have something to measure against many times related to um, to tipping points and regime shifts, um, and that, but but you but you're absolutely right. This is continuously ongoing research. I'm, for example, today uh, we're we're spending quite a lot of time in, in gathering the ocean science community to try and and improve the ocean boundary because the ocean boundary is based only on ocean acidification. It's been recognized for ten years now that that is insufficient. And then we need uh, or looking for a boundary that can represent uh, ocean biology. Uh, what are the limits that that what were uh, beyond what point are we at risk of undermining the function of the ocean if we push the biological pump system, for example, uh, too far? So it, it's just to give you a few, uh, let's say, witnesses from from the lab on on the ongoing work on on planet boundary science. Thank you very much. Um, and um, as we have 10 minutes left, I would like to combine uh, two questions um, for um, 
um, a final statement maybe um, one of our participants um, asked that um, whether um, that we know the climate problem since multiple decades and um, we have the COP28 um, this year and but still emissions are um, rising and um, the question is what gives you hope that we will bend uh, the emissions curve and stay within the 1.5 degree um, limit and um, additionally probably could you also provide us um, with an example of successful climate initiatives driven by grassroots movements or community-led efforts um, that individuals can also draw inspirations from and probably also the students and uh, researchers listening today can also draw inspiration um, from for their own work. Mm. Yeah, so, well, I, I'll be very honest with you that even though, as I mentioned in the talk, that I feel that we made progress at COP28, we have a workable outcome and that it is turning a corner in terms of getting also the oil, coal and gas nations to recognize that, you know, we are on the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel driven era of human development on planet Earth. Despite that, I, I remain very concerned and actually quite pessimistic because we don't see, I mean, it's one thing to get something good on paper or at least workable on paper, but we unfortunately don't see any evidence that that is being translated into actions. I mean, if if you would have had, you know, think of it, if you would have had a, a statement, a really biting statement telling you that this business area is now doomed. It's it's actually that that's basically what what we're saying. It's uh, it's the end of it. You know, we're 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 actually phasing out fossil fuels. Normally, the stock markets would react very dramatically if 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 somebody told you that uh, you know, from now onwards, we're not going to produce more trucks. Of course, the 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 stock market on truck industries would just collapse. Uh, but nothing happened in, in either oil, coal or gas stocks. Nothing happened financially. There was there has been no, no reaction whatsoever. And I think that is uh, symptomatic with, with this crisis that uh, there is a, a rising recognition that we have a problem, but there's, it's not translated into the uh, scale and pace of action required. We, 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 we don't have a deep, deep crisis mode of acting yet. And that that's a concern. And, and concern number two, which I tried to emphasize in this talk, is that unfortunately, phasing out fossil fuels is actually the easy part of the journey. Uh, the food system transition and keeping the ocean and the biosphere, all the other planetary boundaries intact, is, if anything, even more challenging and equally important. So it's um, so that that adds to to the equation. So overall, I, I, you know, I need to leave you with, with, unfortunately, but I think that will come as no surprise to you that, you know, we, we, we're sitting in a very, very challenging position and we need to act accordingly and we need to make the Dubai outcome start having, having teeth and impact, not, not just leave it as, as a piece of paper. And then on your second question, then are there, good examples out there and the answer is yes i mean there's there's undoubtedly uh, many examples which is why um i think many scientists and and people like myself still feel that it's really worth keeping i mean it's always worth keeping uh, the efforts at a high because there is still light in the tunnel i mean we still we still see that there is a possibility of holding, I would argue, holding the 1.5 limit if if we push all we can. But there's also, you know, everything from the Fridays for Future movement, which I think has played and plays a really important role. I think the the scientists for future is quite a remarkable uh, step of of stepping up uh, and stepping out in an uncomfortable position in society to really engage scientifically. Uh, 
I was for many years quite quite critical of of the eco side movement and felt that it was a bit too let's say provoking in the mainstream but many of you probably have run across it I think it's today reached a point of um, a really interesting impact on on uh, considering you know the fundamental destruction of of nature as a, as as a as a crime and that that is now as you know, uh, adopted in the European Union as a, as a principle that that is supported. So to to kind of lift that up in the in the legal framework, I think all the litigation processes on climate is is a really really promising path forward. I think finally, uh, what many might feel as a bit bureaucratic and 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 clunky, but what's happening in the European Union with the CBAM. The carbon border adjustment mechanism might be the most important policy decision of this year to, to have a carbon price at the border of the largest economic region in the world to, to basically punish all imports that have not paid for their carbon emissions at source. And this is, of course, a way of protecting European industry, but it's actually a way of, uh, of organically letting a price on carbon start scaling across the world. I think that's that's quite quite impressive. And I think the European Union and the European Parliament in particular are hanging in there and, and trying to really implement this. And finally, what I'd like to share is that I think what we're seeing in many businesses across the world, I mean, there are definitely reasons to be very skeptical about business and business often playing you know, on double standards, but you also have many companies that that really, really have understood and and see not only the necessity but also the benefits of moving more rapidly towards, let's say, a whole sustainability business model. And um, what we're seeing in uh, when it comes to the car industry in the world, what we're seeing in um, some parts of the food industry, some parts of the fashion industry, uh, I think that is. Um, you know, turning towards new new behaviors, but also new new business models. So there's there are definitely um, areas of inspiration, even though these are still not adding up at the global aggregate scale. But it's important to to recognize them, of course. And and the good the good thing, just to close this, is that they are increasingly also proving that they're not about a moral obligation. They're, they're not being adopted because of awareness being so high and uh, uh, yeah, a, a kind of a moral step, but they're actually a rational step. They are steps towards um, better performance or better outcomes in social, economic and security terms. And I think that's that's the most promising that sustainability is changing from being an environmental issue only, it, it is that as well. Intrinsic values are fundamentally important in nature, but increasingly we see that we learned that in the pandemic, for example, just just remind ourselves of how we suddenly realized how shading in urban areas and green areas in, in cities are fundamental for, for mental health. Uh, the, these are kind of insights that um, that reconnect us to nature, and I think reconnects us to the planet. Quite frankly, in in a in a way that gives a better better welfare outcomes. So I think these are some of the examples that that we need to uh, bring with us as as we try to move move this agenda forward. Thank you very much um, for this like um, exciting lecture as a whole that you gave today and also um, the insights into your work and uh, saying at the uh, COP28, Professor Rockstream and uh, at the 
also thank you for the at least slightly optimistic outlook um, to tackling climate change um, change in the future in your in your closing remarks and um, i would like also to thank all the participants for the lively discussion and uh, sorry that we could not answer all the questions in the time we had but um, it shows that we are working on very important topics and um, i would like also to thank uh, hannah cornelius and britta novak for organizing organizing the event today. And before um, we close the session today, we would like to invite you to also take part um, in the further lectures of our series. We would be delighted to welcome um, you again to the upcoming sessions. And um, the speakers that we have reflect both the diverse areas of work of um, the DAD Global Centers and the broad regional focus um, of the centers. And our next lecture will be on 19th of February and will be given by Dr. Lydia Olaka from the University of uh, Nairobi. She is a DAD alumna um, of the Climate Africa program and she will talk about nature-based uh, solutions in her lecture. Um, so thank you very much, um, Professor Rockstrom, again um, for joining us today. Um, we are looking forward um, to see all of your participants at our upcoming events. We hope you have a nice um, day today and to those of you um, who will celebrate, of course, also Merry Christmas and uh, Happy Holidays. Thank you very much for joining today and um, um, we are ending on time. It's quarter past four, so <laughs> we are on schedule. Thank you very much to, for joining today. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye there.